Good afternoon, and welcome to Kaiser Health News. Welcome to those of you here in DC, and welcome to those of us joining us via Facebook Live. I am Susan Weiss, Enterprise Editor here at Kaiser Health News. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, editorial independent project of the Kaiser Family <clears throat> Foundation. No relation to Kaiser Permanente. We're here today to talk about a really important subject, dementia, one of the most challenging chronic conditions for individuals as well as their caregivers. More than 15 million members provide family members provide care to persons living with dementia in the United States. We've gathered a panel of experts who will deliver insights and help us understand Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. And we will also learn how to improve the lives of people with Alzheimer's and their caregivers too. Your stories and questions matter, and so please share them. I'd like to introduce Ronnie Snyder, Program Director for the John A. Hartford Foundation, one of our sponsors of today's event, and a supporter of KHN's coverage related to aging and improving care for older adults. Ronnie, thank you. Thank you, Susan. This is a great full room. I'm so pleased to see this crowd, uh, particularly because this is such an important topic. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Susan, and also to all of the Kaiser Health News team um, for the important work that you do. Uh, we are proud to support today's event and um, the reporting desk altogether that, re that reports on uh, aging and other issues that are important to the care of older adults. I'm Ronnie Snyder, and I have the distinct privilege of being the program officer at the John A. Hartford Foundation. We are a nonpartisan, just like KHN, uh, philanthropy based in New York City, but we are national in scope. And uh, the foundation was established in 1929 by two brothers, the family owners of the A&P grocery store. Our mission at the John A. Hartford Foundation is to improve the care of older adults. And we work in three main areas. We work uh, to build age-friendly health systems, to support family caregivers, and to improve uh, end-of-life serious illness care. And you'll hear that those three areas are overlapping. They are not siloed, and that is by design. Across all three of those areas, uh, we're addressing the needs of older adults with dementia, so as well as their family caregivers. And we see here, we see more broadly, we see um, as we operate on our, in our daily lives how really critically important that is. Most of us know someone personally who has experienced dementia and um, the devastating effects of Alzheimer's and other dementias. But my message today is that it's more than a personal family matter. This is a societal issue, and it's an issue with societal costs. So if we want to ensure that people who have dementia live with dignity and receive the care they need, we need to ask everyone to do their part. Our healthcare systems, our policymakers, our employers, our community-based organizations, and also our philanthropies. So we can all help to influence the sectors, to build infrastructure and workforce that is needed to uh, deliver good care and to support the family caregivers who too often are left unprepared and unsupported, often leading to high levels of stress, of burden, of isolation, isolation and of devastating costs as well. So at the John A. Hartford Foundation, we're working to change this by spreading evidence-based models of dementia care. We work in partnership with a number of really outstanding partners, organizations like UCLA Health, like the Family Caregiver Alliance, the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging, and AARP, among others. So finally, I just want to say again, thank you to Kaiser Health News. Uh, thank you to the panelists. This is a fantastic panel. Uh, and to everyone in the audience as well for participating today. You all have an important role to play. Uh, we we want to do this together. And we can, together, change the status quo, status quo to create a society where older adults with dementia and their families are cared for and supported. I'm really excited to hear this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. And now I'd like to introduce Judith Graham, who is our Navigating Aging columnist at Kaiser Health News, as well as an 
very accomplished writer, reporter, who has written for many illustrious um, organizations and has done just a formidable job in organizing and bringing our experts together and will lead us in what I hope will be a very enlightening and engaging and um, powerful conversation. Judy? I'm Judy Graham, as you heard. I'm your moderator today, and I write the Navigating Aging column for Kaiser Health News. I'm also the family member of several people who've had dementia. My father had Alzheimer's disease. He died at the age of 72. My sister was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia in 2013 at the age of 56. She passed away two, two years later. I had two uncles with Alzheimer's and a grandfather with vascular dementia as well. So I know dementia up close and personal. It's why I'm passionate about the topic. Today we're going to talk about living well with dementia, and that's not something you often hear about. Our panelists are going to offer a lot of ideas about what that means, but let me offer a few of my own. Forgive me for looking down here. Um, Living well with dementia entails focusing on the lived experience of people with dementia and the people caring for people with dementia. It means paying attention to their quality of life. It means understanding their needs and coming up with strategies to address those needs. It means not writing off people with dementia once they receive a diagnosis. It means enabling people to do as much as they can for as long as they can. And it means respecting their humanity all the way through the course of their condition. Our five panelists are going to offer a wide variety of perspectives on this topic. And let me introduce you to them. On my far right is Mary Rednofsky, um, a former professor and a human rights advocate for people living with dementia a subject that she's currently writing a book about. She was diagnosed 12 years ago with leukodystrophy, leukodystrophy, excuse me, a genetic form of dementia, and she lives independently. With her is, her, is Benji, her medical service dog. <laughs> um, next to Mary is Dr. Helen Kales, a geriatric psychiatrist and professor of psychiatry at the University of Michigan. She's a specialist in the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia and recently co-authored a comprehensive manual for caregivers on this topic that is going to become available on the internet soon, we hope. Next to Helen is Yvonne Laddie. Um, Yvonne is the sole caregiver of her 83-year-old mom who has Alzheimer's disease. She's an advocate for minority families dealing with dementia a journalist. She directs the Reporting New York and Reporting the Nation programs at the Arthur Carter Journalism Institute at NYU. Finally, next to me is Katie Maslow, who was co-chair of last year's National Research Summit on Care, Services, and Supports for Persons with Dementia and Their Caregivers here in Washington, D.C. Katie is a visiting scholar at the Gerontological Society of America and the lead author of a new toolkit designed to help primary care providers diagnose cognitive impairment and, and dementia. And now, my questions. By the way, at, I'm, I'm sorry? Oh my god, I forgot Nancy. How did I skip you over? OK, forgive me. I just jumped right over you. Nancy, Nancy is an associate professor, excuse me, this is what happens with five panelists, at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and co-author of a forthcoming book, Better Living with Dementia. I didn't even know that when I asked her to be on the panel. Better Living with Dementia, Implications for Individuals, Families, Communities, and Societies. She co-authored, she co-developed the first MOOC, Massive Online Open Course on Living with Dementia, which was offered to people across the world. And my apologies, Nancy. <laughs> here, here we go to the questions. Um, so Alzheimer's disease, frontal temporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, and other types. They're all diseases of the brain. Although each of these conditions is different, they share certain things in common. 
one of those is that they progress in stages. Nancy, can you tell us about the stages of dementia and sketch how the challenges related to dementia and strategies to deal with dementia vary by stage? Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's a great question. As you mentioned, regardless of etiology, dementia has a long, slow, progressive course uh, that is irreversible. And so people live for a long time with that diagnosis. Um, and it's characterized by an early stage, a moderate stage, and then an advanced or severe uh, late stage. So even though we have uh, principles that guide care for people with dementia that want to maximize quality of life and dignity and comfort and function, how we go about addressing those needs varies by where people are in their stage. So in the early stage, for example, we would like people to be um, receive accurate diagnosis uh, and timely diagnosis, and in a way that's conveyed that's sensitively uh, conveyed to the person, understanding that this brings with it stigma, um, a sense of impaired, um, a sense of despair for some people because they feel like there's nothing that can be done, um, and so it's very important that people get access to resources and accurate information in the early stage. So information needs is really what people need often in the um, uh, need to have addressed in the early stage. In, in the moderate stage, as people begin to uh, deal with things in addition to memory problems, things like behavior problems, uh, a need for more supervision and security, uh, there, there we need to think about addressing the needs of caregivers and understanding why people are manifesting their needs through their behaviors. Um, we need to understand uh, what caregivers need in terms of tools. These tools are non-pharmacologic in nature, but how do, we, how do we understand these behaviors? How do we tackle them? Um, and how do we provide for the security and safety that people need? Um, and then toward the uh, more advanced stages, here individuals are going to need more round-the-clock care, more physical care. Uh, they need to prepare for end-of-life care. Um, and so here we have to support caregivers in uh, addressing those uh, very profound physical needs that they're addressing, um, preparing for end of life in terms of uh, offering palliative care. So, so the needs shift, but the goals remain the same. Do you recommend that families ask what stage is my family member at? Uh, sometimes that can help because it can help um, the practitioners understand what assessments they could be doing and how they could be proactive in addressing needs. But everyone is different. That's uh, unfortunate. I mean, that you really can't say just because of individuals in the moderate stage that these are the needs. So we, we have to assess people at, at where they are and understand there's multiple other factors that could be involved. I think we're going to return to how the needs vary by stage during the course of this conversation. But let me um, ask Mary. Um, you, you've written about making the transition um, from the old me before um, you understood that you had dementia to the new me after being diagnosed. Can you talk about that? Tell us about the process you went through to get a diagnosis and how you went through that transition. Well, the word transition takes on a new meaning when you have a degenerative disease, whatever it is. And transition doesn't happen necessarily at very clear stages. There's no little red flag that we can raise and say, OK, I'm done with stage one, and I'm going into that middle stage. It doesn't happen. But there are usually precipitating events that let us know that things are changing, especially when they recur. Uh, so I have had subcortical leukoencephalopathy for at least 12 years. But to know that that was the date that I actually got dementia is, is impossible, because it is so insidious. It's so progressive and, and slowly moving. When I was actually first diagnosed, I was misdiagnosed, which is very common, because the symptoms mock other diseases. And in fact, there are 100 different diseases that actually can cause dementia. So mine was originally thought to be multiple sclerosis. Um, that was undiagnosed, and I was re-diagnosed um, with normal aging, but I was only 47. Um, and uh, so it was another eight years, actually, in transition um, of symptoms recurring um, until I eventually figured out that I really needed to get a second and third opinion. 
So when I was re-diagnosed, uh, that was now about four years ago, with subcortical leukoencephalopathy, it's one of the leukodystrophies. It's a rare condition, but it is similar to any of the other dementias in more in executive function problems than in memory problems, which is not uncommon. Um, at first, you, you have a sense of, no, 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 this isn't real. Uh, those white spots on that, that MRI thing, okay, how do we erase them? Uh, yeah, you can't erase them. But um, I tried to say, no, 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 okay, well, so maybe you can put a vacuum in there and suck them out somehow. <laughs> I, I was just wanting to define the problem well so that I could solve it. I, if there's a problem, I can fix it. So uh, that was my original uh, reaction to it. And when I realized there was no cure, um, that was pretty much the time when I realized, well, okay, I better then start really living well. And the first one, 12 years ago, when I was misdiagnosed, was only two years after my mother had been diagnosed. And my mother uh, lived for another seven and a half years with dementia as well. Probably the same one I have, because it's probably genetic. So I did a lot of the things that uh, people with dementia do. I, I researched everything on the internet I could. But I started calling hospitals all around the world. And I started attending lectures at the National Academies of Science. And, uh, going to uh, brain fairs and health fairs. And I just dug right in and said, okay, I got to figure this out. And the uh, best thing I could figure out more recently was I got to keep living. So that's what I do. Thank you, Mary. Um, Katie, um, you were co chair of the first ever National Research Summit on Care Services and Support for People with Dementia and Their Caregivers in October. Um, and I hope you'll share some insights with us throughout this, this talk. I'd like to start by asking you what people with dementia who presented at that conference uh, told the audience about their needs, um, their most um, salient unmet needs, um, and the kinds of changes that they would like to see to live better with their conditions. So we had um, six people with dementia speaking, made, making major talks in the summit. Um, that was a breakthrough. Thank you, Ian Kramer, for your support for that and, and others. But uh, in addition to those six, there were six other people who were part of a group that we called a stakeholder group on for uh, persons living with dementia. And they uh, began meeting by Zoom about eight months before the summit. They met monthly. They provided advice to us about topics for the summit, about um, speakers, possible speakers. And in the end, they uh, wrote up a document uh, that was uh, presenting. This is a research summit. So they were presenting what did they hope research could be conducted to get to. So what are the desirable outcomes? And um, so to me, just. Um, that part of the summit was so exciting. We learned so much from these people about their experience of dementia, what they thought mattered, what was Im important to them, what they were hoping for. All of these people were early stage people. Um, and of course, we need to learn more about that, those kinds of issues, learn how to learn more about those issues from people in later stages. But I would say, um, Judy, that all of these people would agree with what you said earlier about what needs to change. I think that they would all agree to that. But they said some other things also that um, were very moving and um, important. And I want to, so I don't get them wrong, read them to you. So they said, um, we need research to find effective approaches for earlier accurate diagnosis like Mary said. Mm -hmm. We need research to provide person-centered assessment and care planning that includes the individual's preferences and uh, quality of life needs. They said, uh, conduct research to figure out how to provide resources, information, services, and coordinated care 
after diagnosis that are tailored to the person's culture and the person's individual preferences and research to increase understanding about the experience of living independently with dementia and adjusting to life with the cognitive impairment and the implications of living without an identified caregiver. So many people think that all persons with dementia have a caregiver. Many of the people with dementia do not, in early stage in particular, they don't have a caregiver. So they're asking, learn about that topic. They talked about um, things, I was saying this earlier to Judy and other, that we didn't structure the summit to bring out. And those things were really important. They were financial burden. What does it cost the people to, um, for those individuals to get medical care and for their families to provide care and supports? They talked about stigma and how it affects everything for them, how stigma affects what resources they're going to use, uh, where they're, they feel they're able to go, uh, whether they think they can um, get any help anyway, anywhere. And they said, do some research to find uh, ways to get around that stigma. They also emphasized that they wanted to be involved in research. They wanted to be involved as uh, members of the research team to, as they had been doing, um, choose important research topics and then continue through that process, look at the results, try to understand them, and to be involved as research participants, subjects of the research. And um, they, they called this and they said this repeatedly, we want a seat at the table. And one of the people who's an artist brought a chair that she had designed to symbolize we want a, a seat at the table. We want to be involved in this. Um, another uh, woman said, look, look at us. Learn from us as we learn from you. So it was a, it was a beautiful um, part of the summit and a really uh, uh, wonderful thing for me to see especially in terms of this idea of people um, can live better with dementia and how can we help them and how can we know what they think about how to help them. One of the things that happens far too often is somebody is diagnosed with dementia and then assumed to be entirely incompetent. Mm -hmm. As if they, you know, the slate was wiped clean from that moment on. In fact, competencies remain in force for some time, different strengths. And we'll talk about that as, as we go on. But that is a part of stigma that is so painful. And I'm, Mary could talk volumes about this. And I want to hear what you have to say at some point about the sense that um, of being written off as, as incompetent, which has led lots of people not to have a voice in their care and decision making. I'd like to move on to Yvonne. Um, Dementia is a family affair, as anyone who's dealt with the condition knows. You've had plenty of challenges as a caregiver to your mom. Can you describe what happened to your mom and how hard it was to get adequate help? So my mom was uh, declining, I would say, for years. And my mom's an immigrant from the Dominican Republic. And she's a Latina. She's dramatic. There was always a lot of chaos around her. And so I kind of ignored things that I should have paid closer attention to. And by the time things got out of control, it was when my mother was having this crazy hallucination where she was seeing a boy in the house who was basically terrorizing her. And when me and my uncle realized that, that there is no boy, um, I decided to take her to see her doctor, who then um, told us to see this neurologist that he recommended. And um, it was an experience for me in, in seeing how bad the health care is for people of color, for Latinos and African Americans in the Bronx. We were in a waiting room for an hour. There was no place to sit. We go see the doctor, and he misdiagnoses my mother with a, some version of Alzheimer's that she didn't have, and then tells me to Google it, and then shows me the door. 
And so that was my introduction to Alzheimer's. My mother at this point was so confused, she couldn't even cry, so I'm the one who did the crying. Mm -hmm. And since that day, I have had to take care of literally everything. And it has been such an incredible, difficult, challenging experience because my mom, you know, like she's, a, she's an immigrant and she worked hard like all her life so that I could be something, you know, so that I could be who I am today. And now I find myself not in the world that she made for me, but back in the world that I came from when I was a little girl where everything's chaotic and there's so much racism in healthcare and there's such, I mean, everything about everything that has happened to her has been like, I've just, I, you know, even when I got her a really good neurologist out of Columbia Presbyterian, it still was um, chaotic and confusing and unclear. And in October, my mom had to be placed into a, a nursing home. And that's where she is now. And that's been pretty intense as well, like having to make decisions about end of life care. And I can't talk to her about any of this. She just doesn't, she's not involved at all. She's not present in that way. And so it's just, it's been, it's been really challenging. And I remember when I first found out that she had this and I Googled, you know, Latinos and Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. And I found nothing, no stories, no advice, nothing tailored for people that look like me, for people that look like my mom. And so it's been like this kind of thing of me bumbling through and having all this education, being a journalist, thinking that I'm so smart. It's meant nothing, nothing at all. It's like I am just every day, it's like, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't understand. I don't understand this world. It's been like a, like an incredibly weird, scary, frightening journey. And lately, the way that I've been getting myself through, because when I visit my mom, I visit my mom every week at the nursing home. And I never know if she's going to be like verbally abusive towards me or loving. It goes either way. And so what I've been doing before I go in now is I'll like think of a memory of when I was a kid of when me and my mom were really connected. It could be like, you know, her bracelet, her smell, the way she used to pretend she was a bull and chase me around the house. <laughs> or, you know, adventures we had in Dominican Republic together where we went on like a roots trip. And I think about that trip so much. And I think about it before I go into the home, and I think about it when I leave. And I say, that's the woman that I'm fighting for. Not the one that I'm seeing there who's, you know, I can't really communicate with very well, but the woman that's, that's in my memory. That's my mom. I was reading yesterday on the plane on the way here that part of the job of the caregiver, especially in the more advanced stages, is to be the holder of the identity mm -hmm. of the person with dementia. When they, that part of the process of having dementia is losing track sometimes of your identity, and of having that feeling of falling apart, of that things are falling apart, and I hear that in what you're saying. And I hear you also say that you are holding that sense of who your mom is and who your family is, and that you're fighting to preserve that as you, as you go through this. And that's what's giving you your strength on some level. Because so. in the end, my mom is my mom, and the disease is the disease, you know? Mm -hmm. My mom's my mom. So Helen, um, you're a geriatric psychiatrist. How do professionals like you interact with people and their caregivers? Why don't we start there and then I have some other questions to follow. Okay. So probably not all of you know what that is. Um, geriatric psychiatrists, we practice mm -hmm. at the intersection of psychiatry, medicine, and neurology. And because of the complexity of medical issues and psychiatric issues and uh, dementia in later life, Often each patient um, brings to us a different sort of set of symptoms that we need to sift out. So um, one of the first things we do is doing a full um, assessment of what's going on. And so it would be very common, um, you know, sort of heard the theme from Mary of misdiagnosis, that we get somebody who's been seen somewhere else and it doesn't seem to be uh, going well or this doesn't seem to fit. And so part of our job is to um, sort of 
peel that apart and see what, um, you know, it might be common for people to come to us with cognitive impairment and de depression together and to try to sift out what's what. Uh, the second part is ongoing management. And so we will commonly see patients from the beginning of their diagnosis all the way to end of life. And so um, that's been a real privilege for me, I will say that. Um, and my patients and their caregivers have taught me so much over the years that I didn't learn in medical school or residency or fellowship. Um, and an important part of that is working with caregivers like Yvonne. So um, I always think of it as we want to provide person-centered care, but we also want to provide caregiver-centered care because um, the caregiver for me is like my um, point guard. <laughs> you know, like that's the person um, who is carrying everything out, who's hearing the recommendations, and especially this is, uh, you know, in the later stages, um, you know, telling me how things worked. Importantly, caregivers often have high rates of depression and anxiety themselves. And so if that person goes down with the ship, um, we, we may be in real trouble. So that's something um, we really emphasize. And then the other piece of it is, and it, you know, pains me to hear Yvonne's story because it's unfortunately too common, um, we need to connect people with community resources. So, um, you know, we think of dementia as sort of a medical illness, but there's all of these psychological and social issues that go along with it. And so, for example, um, connecting people with respite care for caregivers, that's very important. We want caregivers, for example, to be taking care of, um, you know, their own health needs. Um, we want people with dementia also to not feel, um, I think Mary used the word, stigmatized. I think that's one thing people feel very alone and isolated. So connecting um, with those resources is very key. And then working along with other members of the healthcare team because you know everybody has their role to play. So occupational therapists or physical therapists, primary care physician, and so on. And then uh, lastly, what I've come to realize um, you know, in my career is because I also do research is there aren't enough people that do what I do and will never train enough um, because of the way healthcare uh, is set up and that you know our medical students go into other types of fields. So we need to get training programs out there, not only for our healthcare colleagues and our primary care colleagues, but for caregivers themselves um, so that they can better manage things at home. So that's really something we've been quite dedicated to. So here's the second part for you, Helen, again, um, which is the grief of a diagnosis, the grief for the individual who gets the diagnosis and the grief for the family, mm -hmm. the emotional fallout. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how, what you see, um, what people bring to you, and how, how that can be managed? So, you know, reactions are variable, and I'm always reminded of a study a number of years ago where this was long assumed that people got the diagnosis of depression and inevitably they would go into a deep depression. And when people actually unpacked this and looked at people who, um, you know, their mood assessments before and after diagnosis, lo and behold, on average, people didn't get depressed. So some people do, and I, I'll address that in a minute, but for some people, it's actually a relief. And I found that with a number of my patients that they've long felt that something was wrong. They kept trying to tell people something was wrong, um, but because maybe they were educated and sort of fooled some of the screening tests, it didn't look that way, or they were diagnosed with another condition. And so it's almost a relief in a sense to say, look, there is something going on, and, and there's that um, relief. I do think for other people, there is, um, and depression and dementia um, are intermingled in ways that we're just starting to understand. Some people think that depression may be a prodrome of dementia, meaning an early symptom. For other people, there have been studies that support that maybe recurrent episodes of depression throughout your life may predispose you to uh, dementia. So there's definitely this intermingling of symptoms. But I think um, when there's grief, it's important to think through what we're seeing and the severity of it. So if something is as severe as a major depressive episode, we want to get in there and be very aggressive about treating it. Um, both from a psychological standpoint as well as considering to use medications because in general people will do better in terms of their quality of life and their function if that depression is treated. Um, in terms of grief, if it you know, doesn't meet the threshold for a major depression, what I would say is finding ways to decrease that isolation. I think when people get a diagnosis still in this country, 
Um, it's a little bit hidden. It's a little bit scary. People may not want to tell people or tell their friends. So finding ways to sort of combat that stigma and uh, decrease that sense of isolation. Now, Mary, let me, uh, I have a question for you that follows up. Um, what was it like for you to come out as someone with dementia? And the second piece of that is, have you felt that stigma and isolation? Oh, sure. <clears throat> Sure. Um, uh, anybody who's ever uh, had any uh, condition, and it used to be cancer or AIDS or anything, um, pretty much kept it to themselves. And my generation, I was raised by a family where your personal problems stayed in the family. You didn't go out and air them in public. And so raised as a private person, um, I wasn't really too keen on telling people my diagnosis um, because I was a college professor and, and because I was still trying to get work and moving around. But the uh, part of the problem with the stigma is that even people with dementia believe it. And um, we need educating just as much as the general public. And part of the reason why it's difficult is that we're not completely sure of what we are feeling and thinking anymore because so many people have told us, no, you have this or no, you have that. And when for so many years you are told, no, 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 it's normal. Eh, not so normal for me. I wasn't really like this before. Uh, no, no, no. I could multitask doing five things at a time, and I'm not doing this one thing so good anymore. So, but they go, oh, no, but you've scored so high on these tests. I'm going, okay, that, I'm in the average range. Okay, I, I wasn't just average before. You know, I don't, I, believe me. No, 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 but you're fine. You're fine. You're going to do just fine. Go out, and you'll be happy. So the, 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 the transition and the stigma has to be, well, you either go out and do it all at once and you tell the whole family, say, look, I have this and I'm going to need your help maybe 10, 20 years from now. But you don't know because you don't have a crystal ball because you also don't know how fast the dementia is going to progress in you. Sometimes it progresses very quickly. Sometimes it progresses very slowly. I have friends who've had it for over 20 years. And sometimes they've been misdiagnosed three or four times. But they are still working very hard at maintaining living and not preparing for dying until it's absolutely necessary. They've set things up, right? They have done all of the power of attorney and all of the living will and all of that. But then they set it aside and say, OK, now I'm going to keep on living. Um, it's, uh, uh, it, it is hard. It is not easy. I make it look easy today, but it took a long time for me to get ready for this and to get all you know, fixed up and everything. But they, we have bad days, too. I still have really bad days. But I still have a lot more good days than bad days. And part of that is because I still want to live. Yeah, I have really depressed days and really discouraged days. And sometimes being alone, uh, uh, except with Benji, uh, is easier than some of my friends who have families. Because there is so much emotion attached to the disease and the stigma and the fear and the fear of, oh, she's going to get fragile, so we have to like walk on eggshells. Or, oh, she's not going to understand it, so we better not tell her. And, and of course, what we need is more information, more being included in things. Um, and, and we're not going to be the same as we were when, uh, when, when we were younger and stronger and more with it. Um, but we are who we are today. And sometimes that's going to have to be good enough. And mom isn't going to be mom uh, anymore, the way that you remember her. And that's kind of a frozen memory in time. And you kind of have to let go of that. 
because she is who she is today and you can't change it. And that's really frustrating. I had it with my own mom and I understand it. Um, but who she is today is still a person very capable of caring and loving and she can tell that you're there to help and not to hurt. We know the difference between a, a pat on the back and a slap on the wrist. Um, we still understand a great deal. We still understand even people in very, very late stages can still learn. So there are remarkable things that we can still do. And it helps us if you focus on that part. We can transition more easily. Nancy, I see you shaking your head, and I want to hear your thoughts about what we know at um, not only the early stage, which is intuitive, but the later stages, what we know about what it is that people with dementia can do, yeah, yeah. the well, strengths that remain even as some losses accumulate. It's, it, I was just reflecting on uh, just the conversation up to this point and thinking about the assessments that we do, which are very much deficit focused and not really thinking about the way people preserve, with, have so many, Mary, have so many preserved strengths. Um, and, uh, and even, as you alluded to, people in the, the more severe stages still have preserved memories, and long-term memory um, lasts you know, uh, well into the advanced stages. And, and even muscle memory in terms of things that you used to enjoy doing, you can do well into the advanced stages of the disease. So trying to tap into those preserved strengths that people have um, is it, I mean, we're talking about living well with dementia. We, there is definitely a need for a paradigm shift in terms of our assessments that we do as, just as uh, health pr practitioners to uh, understand that. So I, I want to go back to a topic that came up earlier, which is the difficulty of getting an adequate diagnosis or a correct diagnosis. Both Mary and Yvonne talked about it, and Katie, you, you just wrote that toolkit. Um, can, what advice do you have for individuals and families about who are having trouble getting um, what they perceive as good help from their physicians or from medical clinics. How, how do they find people who really know what they're doing and can help? So, um, that, I don't know. <laughs> I think that uh, this is an extremely difficult problem. And even um, before a person goes for a diagnosis, Somebody has to recognize, that person or somebody else has to recognize there's a problem. There's a impaired cognition. There's a problem with my memory. There's, and um, so in this toolkit, and as we were doing the toolkit, we um, really came to see a problem, see the problem not just as what we usually talk about, which is physicians won't diagnose, they won't, they don't pay attention to cognitive problems, uh, you know, they make mistakes and so on. Um, to see also this beginning phase where the, uh, the person and the family need to have the courage to actually approach a physician. I'm not saying that you didn't do that at all. And I think there are some people that uh, feel that they can approach their physician. But a lot of people don't. They're afraid. They think that if the physician didn't mention it to me, then it must not be a problem. And then the physician thinks, well, if they don't mention it to me, then maybe it's not a problem. Anyway, this is a really difficult um, situation. And when I was thinking about this question of what to advise, so um, as I said, I don't know the answer to this problem. I think that we're making some progress in terms of having the if primary care physicians and other primary care health care workers be aware, more aware of this and more willing to see cognitive impairment when it's right in front of them. But it's slow, and we've been working on this for 20, 30 years now, so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a slow process. So what I'm going to suggest right now is um, uh, a little bit different approach. And it is that as a person with cognitive impairment or as a family member or as someone that interacts with those individuals, has some kind of clinical position, social worker, nurse, um, community health worker, public health worker, that maybe there's a role that those individuals can play 
in encouraging an individual who expresses any concerns about their cognition, say it to your physician. Only physicians are the only ones that can do the diagnosis. So it's not like those other people can um, act instead of the physician. But in terms of being able to introduce this idea and then for the family to back that person up. Another thing, I don't know um, how many of you are aware of this, but um, even sometimes when physicians, or I won't say sometimes, a lot of times, when physicians suggest to a patient who has raised a problem where the physicians recognize it, that they need a diagnostic evaluation in order to um, get appropriate care, the person doesn't follow through. Again, afraid, embarrassed, whatever it is. In the, I've seen um, four studies that show that this is the case with half to 80% of people who had, have gotten, their physician has said, you need a diagnostic evaluation, and they don't go through, follow through with it. So that's another function of a family supporting and of um, others, other health workers and community workers supporting uh, that kind of thing. And again, you know, I don't mean to say at all blaming the person with dementia or the family for not being able to get a diagnosis. That would be absurd. It's just that we're moving slowly with this process with physician training, and we don't have enough Helens. And so um, it's just another way to look at something to do. So, Yvonne, you've um, told me when we spoke earlier that you thought Alzheimer's was just about memory loss, that you didn't realize it's much bigger than that, it, broader than that. Can you talk about some of the other symptoms that you um, had to deal with with your mom and how you have tried to address those? Well, the only thing I knew about Alzheimer's disease was what I saw like on TV and in movies like The Notebook. Mm -hmm. And then there was one about a college professor in Columbia who had, you know, Alzheimer's. And I mean, I didn't know anything about it. So um, with my mom, it's been the biggest thing was the hallucinations, um, the falling for um, mail schemes where people asked her for money and she basically gave away her entire life savings and her 401k. Um, there was a lot of depression. There was a lot of anger, a lot of um, verbal abuse. Um, there was a lot of that going on. And I thought that it was more of this sort of like, you know, you sort of like sit there and then you sort of fade away or something like that, and it's almost elegant. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but it, with my mother, it's been very loud and aggressive and all over the place, and it's like it's raging. It's nothing, there's nothing quiet about it. It's like raging. These um, behavioral symptoms, which become more common in uh, moderate and then later stage, well, moderate to late, are very troublesome and difficult to manage, um, even much more so than the memory loss. And Helen happens to be a specialist in this. So um, a two-pronged question. Um, can you talk about the effectiveness of medications as a strategy and the non-pharmaceutical -pharma alternatives for dealing with these behavioral symptoms? Sure. So just to back up the, the cognitive symptoms that Yvonne was talking about, there are basically two classes of medications that we currently have um, to manage the cognitive symptoms. And it should be stated very clearly, they are not a cure. Um, in, in sort of the vernacular, they may set the clock back. And what that looks like on large studies is that, um, you know, they may uh, improve memory scores by several points. Um, but they are what we have, and so they're the cholinesterase inhibitors and uh, memantine or nemenda. And these medications work by slightly different um, mechanisms, so sometimes they're used together. So often um, people will be placed on these medications at the time of diagnosis, depending on the cause of the dementia, because for some, uh, they're either not as effective or they may actually um, you know, cause some increase in symptoms. 
Um, the behaviors that Yvonne refers to, I think this is such a common misconception that people think of um, Alzheimer's or other dementias as a memory disorder. And I think, you know, some of our field is maybe a little bit responsible for this misnomer because we often call dementia clinics memory clinics, right? Um, but behavioral symptoms are universal in most types of dementia, and they actually can be seen, though as mentioned, they're more common in sort of the moderate to late stages. In some types of dementia, they may actually be the first symptom. So in frontotemporal dementia, for example, that's, that's the behavior that we see. Um, and unfortunately, in this country, we have sort of a medication prescribing culture. So although uh, psychotropic medications, there's none approved by the FDA for use in dementia, these medications are very widely used in dementia. And there was actually recently a uh, report by Human Rights Watch that was published, I believe, last week looking at the use of e these agents for sedation in nursing homes. And I think one thing that's very important that we really, um, and I'm going to get a bit strident here, <laughs> is uh, we really need to shift um, the view of our culture from behaviors as um, problems that we need to sedate and shift that to um, these are methods of communication in many cases, or they could be signs of underlying medical problems. So if somebody is in pain uh, and they can't speak, they may appear agitated to us. But if we give that person an antipsychotic and sort of put them to sleep, are we treating the underlying pain? No. Uh, similarly, if they have an infection, and that will often cause hallucinations or behaviors. Um, if we give somebody a sedating medication, again, we're just covering that over. So medications exist. They're the medications we all use in psychiatry, like antipsychotics, antidepressants, uh, mood stabilizers. I am not anti-medications. As a geriatric psychiatrist, I use these, but we really advocate a targeted use. So meaning we've ruled out other causes first, uh, or if there is such a risk to safety um, that you know, somebody is so aggressive, for example, that you know, somebody is at risk of getting hurt, or um, somebody is so depressed that they're suicidal, then, then we really need to you know, use medications. But if it's a case where somebody is crying out in a nursing home, help, um, maybe they need help. <laughs> so, you know, not to be flippant, but we really should be looking at these underlying causes. So that's one thing um, we're definitely trying to push. The other thing I would say in terms of, and I think Mary illustrated this very well in talking about your sort of transitions, is we don't know that much about whether we can change trajectory. We know there are these risk factors for getting dementia, and some of us in the field feel that there is actually some evidence and some hope that even though somebody is diagnosed with dementia, if they maintain activity cognitively, physically, and socially, uh, that may be able to change things. And, and certainly it's worth a try because the side effects are good rather than bad. So I think I just want to make sure um, that we give that clear hopeful message because I think that people definitely um, can have some self-efficacy and take this into their own hands. Can I, can I add to that? Please. I, I just wanted to add to your comments, Helen, about just how much rigorous research has been gone, in, on, gone on around these non-pharmacologic strategies. Absolutely. There's a strong corpus of evidence from very rigorously conducted studies that show that these, these interventions um, around activity engagement or environmental <coughs> modifications or other things um, if they were a pill, you know, we wish right. they had the effect sizes right. of these medications. So, And some yeah. of the best interventions um. actually are for family caregivers. Mm -hmm. So teaching mm -hmm. and training family caregivers to spot triggers of behaviors. Um, these folks are the best folks who can, um, and, and certainly working with the person with dementia as well, um, what are their interests? What are their things? As opposed to, well, Mrs. Jones always gets agitated at 4 o'clock. How about if we start an activity before mm -hmm. that, which is tailored to something she likes to do? Um, so it's really thinking rather than reactively, thinking proactively. And, and one of the things that can cause some of these behavioral symptoms is a mismatch between the person and their environment. Mm -hmm. And Nancy, I want mm -hmm. to ask you about that. Um, what we've mm -hmm. learned about environmental factors that can be modified mm -hmm. to uh, what, what can serve as triggers for, for behaviors and how environments mm -hmm. can be modified to help make things mm -hmm. easier for people living with dementia. Uh, it's, it's such an um, easily overlooked factor, the, sort of the role of the environment in terms of how it contributes to 
um, to behaviors and to well-being uh, and living well with dementia. Um, and, and if you think about the home environment, it has such meaning to it in terms of safety and security and comfort. And, um, and, and in many homes, because dementia happens in, in older adults typically, except for some rare uh, forms of dementia, you've accumulated a lot of tchotchkes over your life course. So there's lots of stuff you don't even see anymore. Uh, this can cause confusion. It can cause disorientation. It can be a little overstimulating. So one of the first things we do is really have people remove unnecessary items from the home. Keep those treasured items around for nostalgic purposes, but really look at it. Look at how daily life is spent in, um, in the environment. Because the goal is for people to engage um, and to have cues in their environment that let them participate in daily life and, and participate in activities that have meaning for them. So some of that means looking at each room in the home and making sure that it's cued appropriately, that the bedroom is a space that you want to sleep in. It, it gives you, it's colored in a way that is soothing and um, the lighting is such that it, it, it tells your brain it's time to sleep and that it, your dining room is a room that is actually for eating and not many times our dining rooms are kind of the catch-all rooms for many things and, um, and that there's things in place in the room that encourage a, a healthy dining experience and positive dining experience. And that our bathrooms, uh, the clutter in the bathroom is, rem is removed and that the only items that are there are those that are necessary for carrying out our activities of daily living. And maybe there's visual cues there to sort of help remind you these are the things we need to do as part of our activities of daily living so that people can continue to function, uh, continue to engage, and, and really get satisfaction out of those things. So the environment, I mean, certainly there's lots of other things we can talk about around the environment. but. Simple env environmental modifications can go a long way toward helping people stay in their, in their home and enjoy and, and set themselves up for activities. One, one other point I wanted to make about that is that dementia also for, for individuals, it's the setting up for an activity um, that once cued, a person can actually participate in things. So, uh, but setting yourself up for the activity can take a lot of effort. And um, so if family caregivers can learn how to set people up for activities, they can really enjoy those activities and still do them much more one of the skills that can be lost is the ability to initiate, exactly. but the ability to participate remains. Yes, yes, and yes. people mistake that for not wanting to do something, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. the initiation. Um, in three minutes, we're going to go to questions. Mary had her hand up, though. Mm -hmm. I see you wanting to respond. So the issue all about what uh, my colleagues have been calling these behaviors, mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it, um, it has a different, it resonates differently with me because when a person has dementia and is not acting the way that you would expect a person to act or the way that that person reacted in the past or the way that society expects us to act, it's not because we're trying to be difficult. It's not because we're misbehaving. Um, it's it's because we're trying to communicate something. And, and I want to echo that as well from what my colleagues said. But I want that message to come out loud and clear. Mm -hmm. These are forms of communication. Because if you've gone 8 or 12 years being misdiagnosed or misunderstood, your frustration level is going to be a teeny, whit, teeny bit higher than other people's level of frustration. But also, if people have been making decisions for you uh, for years or even a few hours while, oh, here, sit over here, Dr. Rednovsky. Oh, here, Dr. Rednovsky, here's your dinner. Oh, have a nice dinner. Here's your fork. All right. Um, yeah, that's not going to work so well with me, even if I become nonverbal, right? And so, um, as with my mother, because I, I saw I'm a little bit of my mother, we have a little bit of a smart aleck mouth sometimes, I'd probably come up with some cute quip to give that person who was helping me. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the keys to uh, helping and supporting a person with dementia is to ask the person with dementia what he or she wants. And believe it or not, even if we have seemed uncommunicative in the past, there are all sorts of ways that we communicate with our eyes, with our smile, um, 
throwing things. Mm -hmm. uh, here, you, you want some applesauce? Wham! No, that's communication that is not a behavior, okay? It really isn't. And if you treat it like communication and not a behavior, things will go much better in the future. Like, oh, instead of saying, here's your applesauce, it would be, Dr. Radnowski, would you like some applesauce? And I'd go, no. Mm -hmm. Or I would not smile, right? I wouldn't throw anything, I promise. Right? <laughs> so there's, there's, there's ways of supporting people with dementia that are not just behavioral problem avoidance. I guess that's what I wanted to say. In well, the last sad. year of my sister's life, she couldn't talk. And we would ask her a question, offer her choices, which is really important, yes or no? Do you want the applesauce? I meant yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, she could still do that, yeah. and, and it meant something to her to have the choice. And now, half of my questions have gone unanswered because, <laughs> of course, the conversation is just incredibly stimulating. We would like you to be the one to an, uh, ask questions of our audience here. We're going to start with um, people in the room, but people on Facebook, send in your questions, and we'll try to take um, some from them as well. So. Yeah. Um, my question is for Dr. Radnofsky. Um, You talked earlier about risk factors for getting dementia. Um, two questions. One, is your form of dementia, do you think it's genetic because you think your mom had the same type? And can you talk a little bit about some risk factors for getting dementia? Were they well, just I'm not, too many? I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a PhD doctor. So mm -hmm. um, I believe my, my friend to the left will talk about maybe <laughs> some more of the, my friends to the left should talk about, more about the actual risk factors. But um, the, the things that you start to realize are um, making things worse. When you have a condition, um, you start to figure out, well, gosh, if that's bothering me so much, maybe I shouldn't do it. So stress is, is really bad. So unfortunately, I didn't choose when my mom got diagnosed and when I got diagnosed. But getting my first diagnosis two years after my mom did raised my stress level a little bit. And you know, getting divorced or moving or losing your job and looking for a new job. These things were also happening. So all of those factors that increase stress tend to also increase the symptoms. Um, I don't know the actual etiology of that so that I, don't, I can't say that if you do this, then you'll get that. Pretty much we don't know, and that's why I'm a part of the Human Genome Project, and they're trying to figure out some of these things. And there are doctors out there who are prescribing different diets and um, doing things that will meditate. You, you, you meditate and do, doing things that will sort of keep that uh, abated, you know, like not being depressed and getting headaches. Again, these aren't exactly things that you choose, but they are things that maybe um, they can speak to a little bit about. Helen, do you want to comment on the um, sure. um, evidence for um, quanti uh, qualifiable, qu modifiable risk factors? Sure. There's actually a, a great article. I was part of it, so <laughs> um, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Stuff. Sorry, this is live. <laughs> Um, there was a, a very good um, report published last year in The Lancet on preventable, uh, you know, potentially preventable causes of dementia. And the very hopeful estimate that um, we made was that if we were able to, you know, take away all of those today, we could um, prevent up to a third of cases. Now that's probably, you know, pie in the sky, but if we could even prevent 5%, that would be a huge number of people. And so if you look in that article, it's over a life course. One of the biggest protective risk factors, which none of us in the room at this point can do much about, is the amount of education we get as kids. So education is hugely protective. Um, but I will say that I see it in my own patients where folks that you know, have had a lot of education, um, you know, it may be changing your course, too. That's the interesting thing. So I do have a, a, a cognitive reserve that exactly. a lot of other people don't have. Exactly. And so it is, it is masking the disease a lot more. Mm -hmm. and, and doctor a doctor who looked at my MRI said, you have the brain of a 90-year-old. What are you doing here? Mm. Right? He didn't even understand why I was even so, still so talking. So that's perfectly walking. stated, so. is that there have been people who died who, when they looked at their brains, they had 
overwhelming evidence for severe Alzheimer's, but had never really managed. So it's that huge cognitive reserve. In midlife, we identified hearing loss, which was somewhat of a surprise to us. But um, you know, we're sort of thinking maybe in two parts. One is neural mechanisms, but another is the so social isolation that comes along when people um, have severe hearing loss. Um, and then specifically in later life, things like depression, um, you know, medical illnesses. Um, so if you look at that article, you can see in sort of a nice way some of the things we may be able to modulate to um, impact this. For Yvonne, uh, you know, given your background as a journalist, what role do you see uh, journalists of color playing to help raise awareness of this uh, issue, pressing health issue in communities of color? Well, it's really interesting because a lot of my friends on Facebook are journalists of color, and it seems like a lot of us have parents who have Alzheimer's disease. So it's kind of ironic, and yet you don't see a lot of coverage. Mm. And I've wondered about that a lot. Like, I've, you know, I've written about it. Um, I mean, I'm trying to write a book about it. I've thought about doing a podcast about it. But it's just like, it is so difficult to be in this space and then actually do journalism around it. But I think if there was more of a push for people to know about the numbers in our community that are being affected, that it would move journalists of color who may not, who may have had that grandmother or grandfather to actually start telling these stories. Because there's definitely a disconnect between the media and what's going on with all of this. Now, I don't know if it's because we're all getting older and we don't want to, you know, we don't want to go there if we don't have to. Um, or remembering, you know, Abuelita and how she was, you know, she was really a handful at the end and she lived with me. And I mean, I have yeah. students who, of color who have grandparents living with them with Alzheimer's who are telling me things like their whole lives has been like caring for this grandparent. Mm -hmm. This is how they grew up. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe there's just a feeling of, because in our communities there is a lot of, you know, we bring the grandmother home, we bring the grandfather home, and they live with us, and then my mom's always in a bad mood. You know, um, everyone's always tense because, you know, when she has her moments, it's difficult for all of us, and so there's a feeling of wanting when it's over to, to just run away from it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's such a difficult space to live in, and my mom only has an eighth grade education. So that also could be one of the reasons why it's affecting her so intensely. Um, it's really hard when you're dealing with a population that isn't highly educated for the most part, who um, are not able to you know, advocate for themselves or have the language to advocate for themselves. And it all falls on their daughters or sons who are American born. Like I've never felt so um, sensitive in my life about being a daughter of an immigrant. It's like amazing like how it's flipped me, you know, like I have flipped. And I, my first language was English as a second language. My mother learned how to speak English talking to me. And so she had this made up language of English <laughs> that I spoke. And when I was in first grade, they immediately plucked me out and put me in special classes with kids who had just immigrated here. And now when I talk to my mother, it's the same thing. She doesn't speak English anymore. It's this made up version of, it's Spanish, but it's all disjointed. Mm -hmm. And it's a new language now that I'm having to learn in mm -hmm. order to communicate with her. So that issue of a foreign language is exactly what it's like to have dementia. Mm -hmm. It's as though I now speak, metaphorically, a mm -hmm. foreign language mm -hmm. in my own community, family, home, the world. And little by little, that language is getting even more foreign in everything that I do, in my actions, in my skills, in my strategies. And, and, that, and that doesn't have really anything to do with the linguistics of it. It's just a really good metaphor. Mm -hmm. so I do understand that. terrific question from our Facebook Live audience. Um, can the panel comment on the effect of Alzheimer's on the family dynamic and how families break down and siblings become estranged because some can handle it and some can't? It can really mess up your family. <laughs> it really can. It's really intense. Sadly, my only sister was killed in a car accident, so it's just me. But my mom 
really was extremely close to my uncle. I mean, she, in fact, she lived in an apartment in his house. But since she um, has gotten this disease, he's pulled away. It's too much for him. People want to remember what she was like before. The friends are no longer there that were. And it causes a lot of friction. Like, I'm really, I feel really, I love my uncle a lot, but I feel very hurt that he hasn't been there for me in the way that I really desperately, desperately need him to be because I am an only child. And so it creates, I mean, I'm on the Alzheimer's.org, you know, message board all the time, and that seems to be the biggest issue with siblings fighting, mm -hmm. um, children fighting with stepmoms. Um, it creates such, because everyone has a different opinion about how things should be done. Like my uncle wanted my mom to be put in a nursing home immediately. And I could not believe it because she actually was, you know, she was a little bit okay in the beginning. You know, we could manage her. But it causes a lot of stress and a lot of strain. And for my immediate family of my partner and my daughters, it's hard for me to talk about it sometimes because you don't want to be the, like, the Debbie Downer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? It's hard for me to talk about it with my friends because sometimes I'll launch into something that happened last week and I just see them, like, freeze, mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, you know, I can't, oh, Lord, Ivana, you, you know, and I don't want that to be, like, you know, so in a way, the caregiver um, you're, you're, I'm very isolated. You're very isolated in this. And so it becomes really painful. And a lot of times when there's multiple siblings, people have different ideas. And then the, the daughter or the son that's the closest to the parent winds up being isolated. Mm. Anybody else want to comment on that? Or should we move to another question? <laughs> I think that um, it, there is a element of some programs that we have for people with Alzheimer's and other dementias and families that tries to bring the family together, bring the families in for like family counseling. And for some families where there are perhaps multiple people and some of them aren't involved at all, this helps. It brings some support for the caregiver. And I think sometimes it can help to resolve uh, some of the friction that there is. The problem is. with Alzheimer's disease is you get the diagnosis and all of a sudden you're in this really world that you're completely unfamiliar with and not all those resources. Like you guys are all really great. But I, you know, in my little world with my mom in the Bronx, there isn't, you know, I'm like hanging on to the social worker, you know what I mean? Help me please. There isn't anyone saying, oh, well you and your uncle should go to this group and you can talk it out. Right. You know, and also culturally, he's not gonna talk it out with me. He's not gonna talk well, it out with me. <laughs> If I could just make a point, I think um, one of the things that's really important, um, you know, for people like Nancy and I who do research and are clinicians as well, is we need to involve stakeholders in what we do because often the things we might dream up aren't the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of an example I read recently where there's a great caregiver program that's national called Savvy Caregiver. And apparently they tried to translate it into Spanish and it went over like a lead balloon. It mm -hmm. just didn't work with those mm -hmm. families. And one of the problems they identified is that in that program it's sort of like there's a primary caregiver and there's a person with dementia but in the the Latino community it's more like the whole family could be you know maybe not in your case but in, and so they've really had to kind of go back to the drawing board and kind of reimagine this with people who are stakeholders to make it more culturally relevant so we can't just graft things on um, but we need to you know talk to people and figure out what works. It seems to me that members of families who have a member with dementia have a choice in terms of either caring for the person at home or using one of these multiple retirement communities. I wonder if the panel members would comment, I guess, on the pros and cons or their experiences. I'll start out by saying that um, one of the things to be concerned about is many of the communities that advertise themselves as dementia friendly do not actually have, have trained staff in dementia. And there, I just saw that Minnesota now is looking at regulations and Massachusetts has passed regulations to require a certain minimum amount of training. But it's not always the case. Um, and so it's a, it's a case of, of buyer beware. Um, and that's my introductory 
Come in. I mean, I, I, I'm like living in that place right now. I did everything I could to keep my mom at home. It was really, really difficult. You know, you can get AIDS and there's all kinds of ways you can try to do it, but it's so super hard. And so I transitioned her to a nursing home and that was even, that I think was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It's so difficult, but at least I know she's safe. And that's a really big thing with when you're dealing with someone who has Alzheimer's is safety. Because even though in my heart I love her in her apartment and in her own space with these AIDS, you know, they, they steal. Um, you can't get the hours you need. It's another agency to deal with that's very, very chaotic. But in, in the nursing home, you know, they have music therapy and art therapy, and she has a friend. And um, even though sometimes she says she hates it, sometimes she says she had a good day, you know? And so, but emotionally, it is a really, really difficult thing. But ultimately, you just want them to be safe, you know, and have the best quality of life that they can. Mm -hmm. And also, you have to think about, about yourself, like the amount of stress that I was under. I mean, five times a day on the phone, she fell, this happened, that happened. You're just like, I couldn't even, I was getting to the point I couldn't even function. But now everything is sort of, it's sort of, cal it's calmer. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is a difficult decision to make. So the, the reverse side of that, so you get the flip coin, um, is that Yes, um, the person is going to be safe in, in most cases <clears throat> in, uh, in an assisted living or uh, nursing home. But that's not necessarily my purpose for living. My goal is to actually live my life and to enjoy living my life. And in fact, that's my right. That's my human right. And the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is a treaty that was signed by the United States, ratified by 175 other countries <clears throat> through the United Nations, states that I have the right to enjoy my life. A number of other rights, decisions, and things like that. But if I make a decision and I have somehow manifested it, made it really clear, I do not want to live in a nursing home. I want to live in my own home. Even if it's risky, that's a risk I'm willing to take. And it's my right to take that risk. And sure, you don't, as, as my child or as my sister or as my parent, you don't want that person to, to have something bad happen to them. You want to protect them. That is so lovely and so normal. But your right to feel that way stops at the point where my right to have that choice begins. And it has to be negotiated. And it's not a black or white thing. And it's not very, uh, it's, it's not written in stone either that you always have to do what I want. These things have to be balanced against yeah, can I walk out the fire escape and fall down because I tend to think I can fly? Yeah, that, okay, time out. Yeah, that, that's probably not a good one, right? But if I just want to live at home, and maybe I won't eat a balanced meal every day, right? And maybe I won't get outside every day, or maybe I'll sit on the stoop and just talk with everybody all day long. Is that an acceptable risk? And so you have to weigh those as well. So, um, for me, personally, I will never go into a, a facility because I do not want to be segregated from the world. And it's my right to be included in the, the community and participate in things. Mm -hmm. And I want to, even if I can't still actually go swimming in the pool or still play with the kids in the street, I still want to see them. I still want that to be part of living. And if that's a bit of a nuisance to some people, well, I'm sorry, but I still want to live. I just wanted to add to that, because I think, I mean, if you asked anyone would they want to move to a nursing home, there isn't anybody who really voluntarily wants to move to a nursing home. Now, to continue in care retirement communities, perhaps it's different when it's made as a decision before the diagnosis of dementia, but 
I mean, we should be doing more to take care of people at home. Certainly other countries seem to be able to do this. There are many more dementia-friendly community initiatives that are really role models, that could be role models for us to really try to copy. It can't just be the caregiver at their own disposal trying to negotiate this. It really requires a community, if not society, I mean, to yeah, be supporting. Nobody, this is not something that I wanted to do. And like I said, my mother has an eighth grade education. It wasn't like she wrote out, you know, these are my wishes and sure. this is what I want done. Sure. Mm -hmm. What happened was my mother was living in a house with my uncle and my aunt and she was leaving the gas on. She mm -hmm. was wandering out in the street and she was attacking a hallucination with her cane mm -hmm. and she fell three times. Mm -hmm. What am I, what am I going to do? My uncle said she's going to burn down our house. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't know what to do. So it's like if she was like you, I mean, that's the whole thing. Everyone's really different mm -hmm. in this. Mm -hmm. And so each situation is a different situation. Mm -hmm. And so the lesson for me as I get older is to, you know, have, you know, be really clear about what I want and work towards that. But for a lot of people of color, our parents are just not there. We're just not there as a people. And even though I'm educated and I've done well, that's not my mother. My mother's completely different. My uncle's completely different. And there was no, I mean, she wouldn't have been safe with me. It was out of control. And now she's safe. And now I sleep better. And even though I hate it, and I wish that it never happened, you know, the disease is bigger than me, and I have to in some ways respect the disease, you know? I have to respect it and learn to live with it and learn to accept the new reality of my life and her life and love her the way she is. I think we have a question back there. I have a, a very close, kind of close friend who's uh, got temporal, uh, frontal temporal dementia and depressed and has Parkinson's, and she is being given an antipsychotic, and I'm wondering under what circumstances is that appropriate? Because as far as I've researched all of these things and tried to understand drug interactions and side effects and the effect on her of you know, extreme drowsiness and many other things, um, when does it make sense and for, for which of these off-label uses are antipsychotics um, sure. appropriate? So, um, you know, I don't want to speak exactly to that case just because I don't know. I haven't examined your friend and, you know. But um, in general, like I said, we um, endorse uh, the, via multidisciplinary expert panel that I led, we endorse basically three situations. One is, so antidepressants in the case where somebody is severely depressed and they might be suicidal or not eating, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a cause for um, concern. Um, secondly, psychosis, um, but if there's risk. So the case that Yvonne gave us just now where, you know, somebody is trying to hit somebody with a cane and maybe fall, that's a case where I might treat it because there's some element of risk. But, and so you might say to me, Dr. Kales, well, aren't hallucinations always risky? No. I once uh, saw a gentleman who was seeing a wall of Christmas decorations. Family didn't like it. They thought that was terrible. So I said to him, well, how do you experience it? And he said, I love it. It's really pleasant. So I'm not going <laughs> to introduce a medication with risks to somebody who doesn't see something as a problem. And the fact is that these symptoms also are transient. So um, they may come and go. And so we really want to, you know, again, it, if there's psychosis or aggression where there's, you know, a chance of risk, um, or if you've tried everything else and, you know, nothing's working. And, but in most cases, everything else hasn't been tried. Um, so I would really want to know, you know, what they had done and why this specifically was being used. I would say if it's being done to sort of sedate somebody, that's not a good idea. Another question from our Facebook Live audience, um, and Helen, maybe you can address this since you mentioned this earlier, is does the environment play out in the progression of the disease, and if so, how much, um, both in, not in terms of air quality or water quality, but mm -hmm. I think what you were talking about in terms of where a person lives and the structure of their living situation? Well, I mean, I hear in that sort of, uh, uh, sort of, I guess, a question around social or environmental determinants of health. And, and where we live and where we come from does play a role in terms of how dementia manifests itself, when it manifests itself, how aggressively it manifests itself. 
if you've had a stressful life course, you're much more likely to have a more rapidly progressive form of dementia, some of that plays into um, health disparities. and. and um, so that's a, it's a very complex question, but yes, environment does play a role in, um, in the, uh, the aggressiveness um, when, when people are diagnosed with dementia. Hi, I was wondering what some of the best practices to encourage community-based activities and participation, particularly among those facing cultural and social battles with the stigma of dementia. So how are we getting people out of their house, especially when there's the cultural and social stigmas associated with this disease and participating in community activities? I can start a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that has been very helpful to me is to be able to participate first online. There are a lot of online support groups now. And so that already gives me a chance to practice some social skills. And because it's with Zoom or Skype or something where you can actually see the person. It's like having a group of people in your living room again. And if you've been at a dip, if you've been at a low point and it's really difficult to get out and you're feeling that you just want to sit in your bathrobe all day long, then just doing it on, on Zoom, a Zoom chat with dementia mentors or something like that, that feels really good and it gives you a little bit of sense of, well, yeah, maybe I could go to the post office today or maybe I could walk the dog outside today. So little things like that are a good start. And then there are probably other more um, practical things that my colleagues can talk about. So I think activities need to be tailored. I think one of the problems that we see is that, especially in facilities, they kind of use a one size fits all where we're all going to do this or we're all going to do that. And I mean, I wouldn't want to, you know, it's like it's like if everybody's doing the same kind of music, that's going to drive, you know, all five of us probably like different kinds of music. So just think of yourself and what you would want. Um, one of the things we've done is actually create inventories with um, caregivers, for example, where we create lists of things. There's actually, um, I think, one available on the internet that you can kind of go through. And they're very simple things like going for a ride in the car or taking somebody for a walk. Um, but to have these on hand so that, you know, they're, they're sort of ready and they're tailored to the interests of the person. The other thing, just to echo what was said earlier, I think Nancy said it is, you may have to initiate these things. It, it may not be, do you want to do, or, but um, would let's, you like, let's yeah. go for a walk. Mm -hmm. um, or mm -hmm. in, in, if there's a problem with initiation and executive function, may need to sort of set something up first. Um, because if you sort of wait for somebody to do it, it may not, it may not happen. One of the issues is um, there are adult day centers sometimes for people um, who have dementia, though they tend to be one size fits all. And younger people, un unfortunately, there are those who get it before the age of 65. There are o almost no programs for them. And one of the things that's necessary is for more community organizations to become more comfortable working with people with dementia. Invite them to, be, to participate in, in programs. Um, when my sister, she wanted to work on a political campaign just stuffing envelopes, and they wouldn't let her because of perceived liability issues. She just wanted to be someplace where there were other people and she could feel useful. And, and she was told, thank you very much, but no thanks. So I'm a physician, and I was a caregiver for my dad who had vascular dementia, and I cared for him with my sisters for three years. So I'm in a, I was in a very unique position um, of having those two roles. And I just wanted to comment on a couple of things. One is that um, in many cases, um, as the caregiver, it's a huge responsibility, as those of you in the audience who are caregivers know. And one thing that really struck me is that patients with dementia really become invisible to everyone, particularly to healthcare providers. And you know, I, I wasn't aware previously that when you lose your ability to communicate effectively, you essentially lose the right to, or not the right, but you lose the ability to effectively advocate for yourself. And so the caregiver becomes the voice for the, the patient with dementia. And as Ms. Laddie indicated, um, you know, that really can be a difficult position for minorities. And I can say that there were many times when it wasn't until I identified myself as a physician that I felt that my concerns were heard. And part of that was, you know, I was afforded a certain level of authority, but also I knew the language to speak. And so I think that um, many caregivers are at a disservice um, because of that. And I think that we need to do more to 
give them the terminology and the language so that they can effectively communicate with the healthcare team. Unfortunately, we've come to the end. I think there are lots more questions, but I wanted, we're one minute away from 2 o'clock, so I want, first of all, to thank all of you for coming uh, this afternoon. It's been an incredible discussion. Um, those of you who are watching on Facebook, thank you as well. And thanks to all of our panelists for your insights, for sharing. <laughs> I think we can leave with a, we need to do much more as a society to help people with dementia. This is not just an individual family problem, but there's also more that we can do at the individual level, at every level, just echoing what was said before, we need, we need to do more. And, and, and maybe this will serve as motivation to move on and try to affect change for those who have participated here. So again, thank you. Nice job, too.